Good evening. Guten Abend. All right, thank you for joining me. It's been a while. I've been busy. A busy little beaver. Okay, here we go. Shadows begin to fall down the thicket. Everyone with a cute 
there are no islands in space. And the fact is in the world.
star, <laughs> the Large Magellanic Cloud, also called LMC, is a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way at a distance of about 50 kiloparsecs. That's kilos of thousand and parsecs. 50,000 parsecs. And because I knew you'd ask or you'd be interested, one parsec is equivalent to approximately 31 trillion miles <laughs> or 210,000 astronomical units and equates to about 3.3 thousand to find out how many light years. That's why they got to do all that math, you see. And I lost interest in math when they started adding the alphabet. It's just boring. I can't help it. Anyways, parsec is obtained by the use of parallax and trigonometry, and is defined as the distance at which one astronomical unit subtends an angle of one arc second, one thirty-six hundredth of a degree. This corresponds approximately to 648,000 pi astronomical units, i.e. one piece equals one AU slash TAN, one inch. The LMC is the second or third closest galaxy, galaxy to the Milky Way, after the Sagittarius dwarf spheroidal, and the possible dwarf irregular galaxy known as Canis Major over density. The diameter of the LMC is about 14,000 light years making it roughly one one-hundredth as massive as the Milky Way. This makes the LMC, the Large Magellanic Cloud, the fourth largest galaxy in the local group, after the Andromeda Galaxy, M31. The Milky Way and the Triangulum Galaxy, M33. I could have swore I already read this. The LMC is classified as a Magellanic Spiral. It contains a stellar bar that is geometrically off-center, suggesting that it was a bar dwarf spiral galaxy before. Its spiral arms were disrupted, or it could just be forming them, likely by tidal interactions from the small Magellanic Cloud. Tidal interactions in space, trying to understand what they mean. Gravity? I don't know. It's got to be electrical. And the Milky Way's gravity. So, basically, that's what the LMC is. And I did read down here. The Large Magellanic Cloud has a prominent central bar and a spiral arm. The central bar seems to be warped so that the east and west ends are nearer the Milky Way than the middle. In 2014, measurements from the Hubble Telescope made it possible to determine that the LMC has a rotation period of about 250 million years. The LMC was long considered to be a planar galaxy that could be assumed to lie at a single distance from the solar system. However, 1986, Caldwell and Coulson found that field cephoid variables in the northeast lie closer to the Milky Way than those in the southeast. From 2001 to 2002, this inclined geometry was confirmed by the same means, by core helium burning red clump stars, and by the tip of the red giant branch of electricity. <laughs> LMC's disk is both thick and flared. Hmm. And uh, there's one more thing I wanted to. Like many irregular galaxies, the, F, the LMC is rich in gas and dust and is currently undergoing vigorous star formation activity. Galaxy. It holds the Tarantula Nebula, the most active star forming region in the local group. That doesn't seem to be a uh, galaxy on its way out. It seems to be a galaxy on its way up. The LMC has a wide range of galactic objects and phenomena that make it known as an astronomical treasure house, a great celestial laboratory for the study of the growth of the evolution of stars. Per Robert Burnham Jr., surveys of the galaxy have found 
roughly 60 globular clusters, 400 planetary nebula, and 700 open clusters, along with hundreds of thousands of giant and supergiant stars. Jump over to thunderbolts here. The largest dwarf. Vista telescope image of the large Magellanic Cloud, a dwarf galaxy orbiting the Milky Way. Stars and clusters within the large Magellanic Cloud, LMC, do not conform to standard model. Any man who can hitch the length and breadth of the galaxy, rough its slummet, struggle against terrible odds, win through, and still knows where his towel is, is clearly a man to be reckoned with. Douglas Adams. The LMC is a relatively small, irregular galaxy, approximately 168,000 light years from Earth. The distance is approximate because different parallax values are obtained when different measuring sticks are used. Remember what I told you, even though how they know how far stars away is a theory. Within the LMC are objects commonly referred to as supernova remnants. Since the prevailing theories of stellar evolution describe a particular kind of death when stars are extremely massive, they are short-lived converting mass into radiant energy at a furious rate through a process of nuclear fusion. Once their nuclear fuel is exhausted, they implode, blowing off their outer shells of gas and dust. The standard theory of star formation is based on gravity, which is supposed to concentrate dust and gas into smaller and smaller dimensions until fusion transforms matter into a plasma state. Regions where the gas is most dense are where more stars should be born. However, different observations find that stars on the outside of many nebulae in the LMC are older than those inside. This is considered to be mysterious by consensus astrophysics. Astrophysicists. In an electric universe, gravity is most often overshadowed by plasma's behavior. Stars are the loci of galactic z-pinches in Birkeland currents. As written elsewhere many times, positive charge builds up on one side of a double layer and negative charge on the other. Strong electric fields initiate electric charge flow through nebular plasmas, causing charges to spiral down into filaments that can eventually form arc mode or glow mode issues. Stephen Smith. Just thought I'd throw that in there since we were on the LMC. It's always good to hear from the Thunderbolts group. A couple of things on Seifert galaxies, in case you're wondering. I did a little digging on them. Uh, basically, according to mainstream, um, Seifert galaxy, any of a class of galaxies known to have an active nuclei. Such galaxies were named after the American astronomer Carl Seifert. Seifert galaxies appear normal in ordinary images, but are extremely strong sources of infrared radiation. Moreover, many are powerful sources of radio energy and x-rays as well. And uh, I picked this here. A Seifert flare is not really a common term. The authors refer to an energetic outburst from the type of active galaxies called Seifert galaxies. What do you suppose that energy is? There's only one kind of energy that I know about, and that's electricity. Them Seifert flares are when they bear quasar. Halt and Art produced such a body of work that is corroborating his research that he wrote a book with it, and they still, they still pretend that he either didn't exist or that he was debunked. And neither one is. They just make it up as they go. Halt and R prove beyond a reasonable doubt that quasars are proto galaxies born from the immense sea of plasma at the core of the galaxy when they are in their active period. They're called Seifert galaxies. And I would maintain that they have their young 
when they're young. Then they settle down and live their lives. So the Milky Way has already had its children. But every galaxy probably goes through this metamorphosis. And new galaxies are born continuously. Life is being reborn every second in the universe. Then the universe would no doubt be eternal with galaxies constantly being born. Who knows how long has been here? There's no way they can even get close to knowing. They don't even know what a quasar is. I saw a question on a website. Could the Milky Way turn into a quasar? <laughs> That's mainstream. Since a quasar, by all indicators from the empirical research of Halton, are a proto-galaxy. Just so you know, proto means original or primitive. And the Milky Way is who knows how old. No, it could never be a quasar again. At least I don't think so. That would be like people reverting back to babies. The Milky Way is young would probably be the Magellanic Clouds. And now I read that they discovered a dwarf galaxy. You see, they're clever. We see quasars coming out of galaxies and they make up gravitational lensing and defeat it in their minds. And that's how we do science, I guess. It's the single bullet theory of cosmology, or should I say the magic bullet. The arrow? Time? 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 What does a dead galaxy look like? I don't think I've ever seen one. The Ice Age and the Antiquity of Man The mammoth lived in the Age of Man. Man pictured it on the walls of caves. Remains of men have repeatedly been found in Central Europe together with the remains of mammoths. Occasionally, the settlements of Neolithic man of Europe are found strewn with the bones of mammoths. Man moved southward when Europe was covered with ice and returned when the ice retreated. Historical man witnessed great variation in climate. The man of Siberia, the meat of which is still fresh, is supposed to have been destroyed at the end of the last glacial period. Simultaneously with the mammoths of Europe and Alaska, if this is so, the Siberian mammoth was also the contemporary of a rather modern man. At the time when Europe, close to the ice sheet, man was still in the later stages of Neolithic culture, in the Near and Middle East the region of the great cultures of antiquity. He may already have progressed well in, into the Metal Age. There exists no chronological table of Neolithic culture because the art of writing was invented approximately at the advent of the, of the Copper, the early period of the Bronze Age. It is presumed that the Neolithic man of Europe left pictures but no inscriptions and consequently there are no means of determining the end of the Ice Age in terms of chronology. Geologists have tried to find the time of the end of the last glacial period by measuring the detritus carried by rivers from the glaciers and the deposits of detritus and lakes. The quantity carried by the Rhone from the glaciers of the Alps and the amount on the bottom of Lake Geneva through which the Rhone flows were calculated, and from the figures obtained the time and velocity of the retreat of the glacial sheet of the last glacial period were estimated. According to the Swiss scholar Francis Farrell, 12,000 years have passed since the time the ice sheet of the last glacial period began to melt, an unexpectedly low figure, as it was thought that the ice age ended 30 to 50,000 years ago. Such calculations suffer from being only indirect evaluations, and since the velocity at which the glacial mud had been deposited in the lakes was not constant, and the amount varied, the mud must have assembled on the bottom of the lake at a faster rate in the beginning when the glaciers were larger, and if the ice age terminated suddenly, the deposition of detritus, detritus would have been much heavier at first, and there would be little analogy to the accumulation of detritus from the seasonal melting of snow in the Alps. Therefore, the time that has elapsed since the end of the last glacial period must have been even shorter 
than reckoned. Geologists regard the Great Lakes of America as having been formed at the end of the Ice Age, when continental glacier retreated and the depressions freed from glacier became lakes. In the last 200 years, Niagara Falls has retreated from Lake Ontario toward Lake Erie at a rate of about five feet annually, washing down the rocks of the bed of the falls. This process has been going on at the same rate since the end of the last glacial period. About 7,000 years were needed to move Niagara Falls from the, its present position. The assumption that the quantity of water moving through the gorge has been uniform since the end of the ice age is the business since the end of the ice age is the basis of this calculation and therefore it has concluded 7000 years may constitute the maximum length of time since the birth of the falls in the beginning when immense masses of water were released by the retreat of the continental glacier the rate of movement of Niagara Falls must have been much more rapid. The time estimate may need significant reduction and is sometimes lowered to 5,000 years. The erosion and sedimentation of the shores and the bottom of Lake Michigan also suggest a lapse of time counted in thousands, but not in tens of thousands of years. Also, the result of paleontological research in America carries evidence which constitutes a guarantee that before the last period of glaciation, modern man in the form of that highly developed race, the American Indian, was living on the eastern seaboard of North America. It is assumed that with the advent of the last glacial period, the Indians retreated southward, returning to the north, when the ice uncovered the ground, and when the Great Lakes emerged, the basin of St. Lawrence was formed, and Niagara Falls began its retreat toward Lake Erie. If the end of the last glacial period occurred only a few thousand years ago, in historical times, or at a time when the art of writing made in the centers of ancient civilization, rocks by nature, and the records written by man must have coordinated a picture, must give a coordinated picture. Let us therefore investigate the traditions, let us therefore investigate the traditions and the literary records of ancient man and compare them with the records of nature. Shamanism assumes that everything has a soul, the people, the trees, the animals, the stones, and so on. Everything is connected to everything. Everything is equal with everything and is part of the great spirit. Shamanism is of all times and occurs on every continent, but originated in eastern Siberia and Mongolia. The word shaman comes from the Tungus, a Siberian language, and means the aesthetic anthropologist assumes that shamanism originated in the Old Stone Age. It is probably the forerunner of many other religious and magical traditions. Shamanism now. Some Native Americans assume Western people of myths using their rituals and views, and they are quite right, because Western society has little information about their own ancient rituals and the customs of their ancestors. And yet we feel the shamanic attraction, and we want to delve into this. But because the current knowledge of shamanism is based on that of cultures in which this still plays a role, it is also logical that our attention mainly focuses on the shamanism of Native Americans. Universal Symbolism Many shamanistic views and utterances use a universal symbolism and are therefore not specifically culture-related. Although we are, of course, always connected to the country where we live, so there will be differences for each region and people. What is a shaman? A shaman is a kind of bridge, an intermediary between the people and the spirit world. The shaman also works for people who have problems or are ill. The shaman tries to rebalance disturbed balance. With ritual dances and drums, rattles, and the voice, the shaman evokes a state of consciousness with which he brings himself into a trance, a state of mind that makes it possible to travel through different worlds and to make contact with personal helper spirits. Such a ritual almost always follows a fixed pattern. The shaman dances and sings, often in special clothing, and uses a drum or rattle to get into trance. When the shaman returns from the travels, he reports on his journey to other worlds. There are three worlds, an upper, 
in an underworld, and the world as we know it, the physical world. The latter is called the middle world. In these other worlds, you will find guides, spirits, and ancestors. During his training, a shaman gains the skill to make contact with other worlds, supported by helpers such as totem animals, totem trees, and nature beings. When shamans go into a trance, their soul travels to the upper world to favor the gods, and to the underworld to recover the souls of sick people, or to accompany those of deceased people. Many shamans say that they travel to the upper world as a bird. In the past, a shaman within a community had, as it were, the function of priest, healer, and clairvoyant. The modern shaman still assumes that the natural balance between earthly and spiritual matters is disrupted in the case of problems of humans and animals. Shamans are always employed by the community and have different tasks depending on their talent. Women have traditionally been mainly occupied with herbal medicine, taking care of wounds and other medical problems with an identifiable cause. Women have also been active as midwives since time immemorial. 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 In fact, you can perform rituals in any environment in a forest, but also in your own back garden, even in your bedroom. To bring shamanism into our lives, we do not have to reproduce the rituals of other peoples one by one. Guides can also contact you through your dreams. Look around you at what is now playing a role in your life, and ask yourself what is needed in your immediate environment. Look for the balance and offer support where necessary and desirable. Do not insist on anything. Respect your fellow man, including those with a different opinion. Reset Act. Corcapelli is an ancient character, dancing flute player, whose oldest manifestation is found on prehistoric American rock carvings. The origins of the figure are a mystery, and he figures in many Native American stories. Where his age and role vary, he is generally believed to have been a fertility symbol, often depicted as a phallic character, carrying a pouch of seeds or wearing antlers. Cocapelli symbols often appear in the context of rain, pregnancy, prosperity, and marriage. Power animals. In shamanic belief, everything is alive and carries with it power and wisdom. Power animals are an essential component of shamanic practice. They are the helping spirit which add the power of the shaman and are essential for success in any venture undertaken by the shaman. Shamans believe that everyone has power animals, animal spirits which reside with each individual, adding to their power and protecting them from illness, acting similarly to a guardian angel. Each power animal that you have increases your power so that illnesses or negative energy cannot enter your body. The spirit also lends you the wisdom of its kind. A hawk spirit will give you hawk wisdom and lend you some of the attributes of the hawk. Everyone has a power animal. Everyone is thought to have a few of these guardian power animals from childhood on. Over the course of her or his life, a person may have several, especially I think if you were an animal in a previous life, I would think. If a power animal leaves and one does not come to take its place, the individual is considered by the shaman to be disempowered and therefore vulnerable to illness and bad luck. Power animal retrieval is a healing where the shaman goes to find a new power animal for you. Power animals do not have to be mammals and can be reptiles, insects, or sea creatures. Any living creature can serve as a power animal. Trees can serve as plant and spirit guides. Domesticated animals are generally not considered power animals because they are already in service to human beings. It is possible to have a domesticated animal, but it is more likely to have a wild, untamed animal serve in the capacity of power animal. The gifts that a particular animal is thought to give an individual varies depending on the culture, although there are certain consistencies for certain animals. A particular power animal can come to help you with an issue that is very specific for you. It is important not to lock each animal into a category and be open to the gifts it may be coming to share with you. If you are looking for a book on power animals, Animal Speak by Ted Andrews is very popular. A popular website that describes the qualities of various power animals is www.animalspirits.com. 
honoring power animals. It is important to honor your power animal. In many Western cultures, we are not taught to value animals or the gifts that they add to our lives and the world around us. In shamanic work, the power animal is essential. For a shaman who has no power, is not going to have very good results. On a personal level, by honoring your power animal, you let it know that its assistance is appreciated. The spirit of the animal is giving up its mobility in order to spend its time with you and assist you with your life. Also, by honoring the power animal, we make deeper connection with it. Honoring it can be as simple as saying a thank you inside yourself or getting an object which represents it and putting it where you can see That's it as you go. the Corcopelli figure. Shamanic practice going 35 miles an hour and just walk away from it. I mean, he spent a week in the hospital, but his healing was just nothing short of miraculous. Perhaps his power animals were looking out for him. Finding your power animal. If you would like to find out who your power animal is, Consulting a shamanic practitioner is an option, but to discover this on your own, you can ask for a dream and see if anything comes up. You can ask the power animal to show itself to you, and if you start seeing one or another animal frequently, that would be its best way of revealing itself to you. For instance, you are flipping through the channels and see an elk on a nature program. Then later you hear someone talking about an, about going to Elk Grove Village to visit your cousin. You see a sign for an Elk's Lodge. It is believed that the animal guide can communicate with you by drawing your attention to things around you, and a repetition such as that would be a way of communication. I scoff at nothing, you know, because of course some things sound out there, but that's only because I'm not familiar with that. Why do spirits communicate in symbols? Hmm. Anyone who has done a few shamanic journeys knows that questions are very rarely answered with yes or no answer. You may also visit a shaman and find that the information they give you is frustrating or doesn't seem to be clear. Why do journeys get communicated in stories and symbols? The information that comes on a shamanic journey is almost always trying to convey something deeper that can be put into words. Words can be rather limited in what they can convey, convey. And yes or no answers do not often convey much depth of understanding or truth. If you take a moment to think about word meaning, you can see what I mean. For instance, what does it mean when someone says they are sad? How much is it? How strong? Is it light or heavy? Is it passing through in the moment? A person would have to use a bunch of words if they wanted to convey exactly in which way they are feeling sad. Many of the words we use have this limitation, and the purpose of a journey is not just to answer a question. There's a deeper reality to any question you pose. Why you are having trouble finding a job right now? What would you need in order to move forward? Even questions of should I or should I not do this thing are tied to more than one aspect of your life, your being, and your history. So when you get an answer, it is in the form of a story or a metaphor, or even a sensation or a smell. It is meant to convey something. The stories and metaphors are usually not literal. When you ask a question in a journey, the purpose of the answer is not only to give you a deeper understanding, but it is also meant to shift you into a new direction. Sometimes you get an answer that makes no sense to you, and one day what it means becomes clear. Sometimes the answer may never be clear to you. The answer may not need to be clear. That is, because a journey answer is meant to speak to you on many levels. Some of these are levels that you may not be conscious of. Your subconscious is aware of a bunch of stuff that you never think out loud. For instance, many of us have had that moment where we said, I knew there was something wrong with that person. Maybe it was a boyfriend or a girlfriend, neighbor or business associate. I'm not talking about instances of hindsight, but times where you realize only after the fact that you knew that there was something wrong with that person, that you kept telling yourself you could trust. The way I think of it is that you did know, but you didn't know out loud. You weren't fully conscious of knowing, and therefore your knowing was more like a whisper. I get it all the time. I just assume it's intuition. So when you get a symbol, this includes a story, sensation, 
a metaphor or a song. And this it speaks to this deeper part of yourself. This part of you knows what the symbol means in a quiet way. Once that part of you receives the information, shifts can occur at this deeper level. You didn't know that the lion answered your question, but you begin to start considering bold ways to approach your problem. The rain and the somber field you saw in your journey did not seem related to the question, but a few days or a week down the road, a forgotten memory comes back to you and gives you information on why you're stuck right now. The field and the rain conveying a feeling and a deeper part of yourself found that related memory and brought it back into your awareness. I'm always drawn to the rain. That's something about it. I, don't, I can't really explain it, but I love rainstorms. Shamanic answers are meant to penetrate your being and to be penetrated by you as you work to understand them. In the process, you may or may not be able to see how changes are occurring in your life. Some people keep a journal of their journeys and then go back later to reread them later. I have heard people talk about something they've journeyed on becoming clear later or being able to see that each journey plugged into a greater picture conveyed over time. There's no telling what a journey answers ultimate purpose is. Even a yes or no answer is likely deeper than you think. I used to journey and ask questions like, are you really sure I should be a healer? I would get the answer, no. And in pause, I'd feel insecure and think that can't be right. Then the second part of the answer would come, I know you should be a healer. I tend to get this answer most often when I already knew the answer to my question and was only asking out of insecurity. This particular way of answering my question evoked my own knowing, my true knowledge of the answer. A symbol, a story, a scent, or a feeling in a journey is meant to cut through, reach into and beyond our everyday understanding. Answers are not meant to be as easy as a grab-and-go sandwich or to address what is purely mental as, say, understanding how gravity works. The spirits or images that come to answer your questions have a rather reaching goal than you getting a factual piece of information. Somehow, the answers fit into the totality of your life and your needs what could be healed for you, and what you have the possibility to create. Perhaps, in the end, people who stay with the shamanic journey are those who are looking for deeper changes. It's perfectly okay if this doesn't suit what you want or need, but it might be worth giving it a try. The efficiency of shamanic work is only ever judged on the results, and sometimes the results of journeys can only be seen or understood over time. Quite a bit more here, but I think I'll stop now on this. All right, a little bit more. Protecting yourself from negative energy. One of the best ways to protect yourself from negative energy is to make sure you are filled with good energy yourself. However, the stress of our lives can mean that we aren't always as filled with our own energy as we might like. Sometimes protecting yourself is needed to make sure you don't take on negative energy. Also, new shamanic healers may be interacting and calling energies that they hadn't been used to dealing with. They can need protection while they are learning how to manage these energies. What is negative energy? Negative energy is not bad energy. Rather, it is something that is not helping to make you healthier, or it is weighing you down in some way. Your own stress and worry can be stored in your body as negative energy. I think scientifically they have proven that. Stress affects your DNA. Once the stress is stored in a part of your body, it can cause a weakness where that can lead to an illness. As for sources of negative energy outside of you, these can come from a variety of sources. Other people's emotions are the most common source. Spending time in place where people are stressed out can cause you to absorb some of that energy. People who are envious of you can unconsciously send energy to you that is not helpful. Someone gets angry in traffic and they can send you ang send anger at you. Sometimes an environment will be filled with negative energy. In some cases, the energy simply might not be compatible with you. For instance, some people feel drained by the busy bustle of a city 
where someone else is not compatible with your energy, you can feel drained. You know what drains me? Is when someone proclaims themselves to be a not mean, but the place is a bad place. Just that the energy never got transformed. It is stuck. I had to be form, mad at my isn't ex. flowing and changing <laughs> as it is meant to. Shamans are trained how to transform energy from one state into a more positive one. They use this ability to change energy within themselves and clear the energies in other people in spaces or environments. However, many people don't get it with people that were playing darts. They had a group of people not imagine anything, and they had another group of people imagine themselves throwing bullseyes. And the people that's more successful than the people who weren't. So that is another fact that has been proven. Yeah, I have something <clears throat> on the mind of a matter thing. I read this a couple of years ago, but it's stuck in my head. They did a this survey or test, where you want to do it, with people with uh, bad knees that needed a knee replacement. Well, according to this article, I remember because it was just like blew me away. The half of the people didn't receive anything. They were just put to sleep. And the other half of the people received the knee replacement. And after six weeks, 75% of both groups said that they had no more pain left. So it can have a huge factor in everything. I've heard the cliche, thoughts are uh, actions. Thoughts are fate. Yeah, thoughts are fate. So you got to be, you know, not thinking that negative. If you get off track, you just get right back on. Okay, this is almost over. That's what it reminded me. Whether you know it or not, you have an innate ability to protect yourself from the energy that is not helpful or healthy to you. Using a visualization is one of the ways you can engage that ability. Even though you can't remember how to create protection, your body knows. So the visualization sends the message of what you want to do so that your body can do that. Most visualizations involve seeing yourself surrounded by protection of some kind. I do that all the time. My light is gold. Eventually, your visualizations won't be needed anymore as the protection becomes a habit. You don't want to be too heavily protected all the time, though. It's not healthy to be disconnected from your environment. Healthy energy protection should allow you to be more open to the world around you. Visualization that completely block out the energy of your environment should only be used occasionally such as when you are in an especially negative environment. It's best that what you visualize allows positive energy to enter and leave through the protection. Some visualizations. Blue egg. Visualize a see-through blue egg that allows good energy to come in and out and keeps bad energy out. The egg surrounds you as you go about your day. Mirror. Visualize a mirror that bounces negativity energy back to the sender. This is especially good to use if you have one person that seems to be sending you negative energy all the time. You can use the mirror for that person only, rather than the heavy protection around you all the time. You see a mirror standing between yourself and that person, and that anything they send at you goes right back to them brick wall. Imagine a brick wall is a visualization. Imagining a brick wall is a visualization that you should only use for especially bad environments. It blocks all, all energy. If you have to use it all the time, such as at work, you may wish to consider ways, other ways of protecting yourself, or ways of protecting your personal space with items as discussed below. You don't want to use a brick wall to become a habit. You don't want using a brick wall to become a habit. Methods. Many of the methods of energy protection involve filling yourself with positive energy. 
things like pranic breathing, meditation, tai chi, or any number of methods can put you in a state where you are less likely to take on negative energy. Methods that affect the energy surrounding you can also be effective. Breathing is always a powerful way of managing your own energy and the energy surrounding you. Sound can also be powerful and something as simple as humming can clear your space near you of negative energy. You can ask a guardian spirit or power animal to put protection around you. They will not do this unless asked out of respect for your personal space. However, they can offer very powerful negative energy or to provide yourself protection personally. The Ice Age and the Antiquity of You know, what I would do is, uh, if I was playing ball or something like that where I needed my concentration and doubts crept into my mind, you know, because sometimes you get them doubts in your head, you know, what if I fail? Well, that's, you're on your way to fail. You got to know you're going to succeed. And I always imagine myself taking a little piece of paper and then throwing it away. Uh, sometimes I actually make the throwing motion. Just get out of my head. You know, and you're, you're supposed to not think. It's just like anything else, you know. If you're shooting a foul shot, if you're whatever, you have to concentrate. You're driving off the tee or you're trying to put down an important putt. It's all the same. you got to have that confidence because doubt is what helps you beat yourself. Hey, I just came up with that. That's pretty good. Let's write that down. <laughs> All right, I got one more for you before I sail off into the west during skies. Man. The mammoth lived in the age of man. Man pictured it on the walls of caves. Remains of men have repeatedly been found in Central Europe together with the remains of mammoths. Occasionally, the settlements of Neolithic man of Europe are found strewn with the bones of mammoths. Man moved southward when Europe was covered with ice and returned. By the way, I'm in retreat. chat. Historical uh, man witnessed great variation in climate. The man of Siberia, the meat of which is still fresh, is supposed to have been destroyed at the end of the last glacial period. Simultaneously with the mammoths of Europe and Alaska, if this is so, the Siberian mammoth was also the contemporary of a rather modern man. At the time when Europe, close to the ice sheet, man was still in the later stages of Neolithic culture, in the Near and Middle East, the region of the great cultures of antiquity. He may already have progressed well in, into the Metal Age. There exists no chronological table of Neolithic culture because the art of writing was invented approximately at the advent of the, of the copper, the early period of the Bronze Age. It is presumed that the Neolithic man of Europe left pictures but no inscriptions, and consequently there are no means of determining the end of the Ice Age in terms of chronology. Geologists have tried to find the time of the end of the last glacial period by measuring the detritus carried by rivers from the glaciers and the deposits of detritus and lakes. The quantity carried by the Rhone from the glaciers of the Alps and the amount on the bottom of Lake Geneva through which the Rhone flows were calculated, and from the figures obtained the time and velocity of the retreat of the glacial sheet of the last glacial period were estimated. According to the Swiss scholar Francis Farrell, 12,000 years have passed since the time the ice sheet of the last glacial period began to melt, an unexpectedly low figure, as it was thought that the ice age ended 30 to 50,000 years ago. Such calculations suffer from being only indirect evaluations, and since the velocity at which the glacial mud had been deposited in the lakes was not constant and the amount varied the mud must have assembled on the bottom of the lake at a faster rate in the beginning when the glaciers were larger and if the ice age terminated suddenly the deposition of detritus detritus would have been 
much heavier at first, and there would be little analogy to the accumulation of detritus from the seasonal melting of snow in the Alps. Therefore, the time that has elapsed since the end of the last glacial period must have been even shorter than reckoned. Geologists regard the Great Lakes of America as having been formed at the end of the Ice Age, when continental glacier retreated and the depressions freed from glacier became lakes. In the last 200 years, Niagara Falls has retreated from Lake Ontario toward Lake Erie at a rate of about five feet annually, washing down the rocks of the bed of the falls. This process has been going on at the same rate since the end of the last glacial period. About 7,000 years were needed to move Niagara Falls from the present position. The assumption that the quantity of water moving through the gorge has been uniform since the end of the ice age is the business since the end of the ice age is the basis of this calculation and therefore it has concluded 7000 years may constitute the maximum length of time since the birth of the falls in the beginning when immense masses of water were released by the retreat of the continental glacier the rate of movement of Niagara Falls must have been much more rapid. The time estimate may need significant reduction and is sometimes lowered to 5,000 years. The erosion and sedimentation of the shores and the bottom of Lake Michigan also suggest a lapse of time counted in thousands, but not in tens of thousands of years. Also, the result of paleontological research in America carries evidence which constitutes a guarantee that before the last period of glaciation, modern man in the form of that highly developed race, the American Indian, was living on the eastern seaboard of North America. It is assumed that with the advent of the last glacial period, the Indians retreated southward, returning to the north, when the ice uncovered the ground, and when the Great Lakes emerged, the basin of St. Lawrence was formed, and Niagara Falls began its retreat.